From scrapped Pokemon to changed designs and even cut human characters, we've been covering a lot of cut Pokemon content lately, and I certainly hope you guys are enjoying it as much as I am. In today's video, we're going to be doing more or less the same thing, this time though revolving around Pokemon forms. As you probably know, some Pokemon have alternate forms that they can temporarily turn into during the course of a battle, or thanks to some other kind of ability. But much like many other aspects of the Pokemon franchise, there are several alternate forms of various Pokemon that were either cut altogether or for some reason didn't make their way into the main series Pokemon games. These are all really interesting, which is why we're highlighting them here, so without any further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at 10 awesome Pokemon forms that never made the final main series game. Kicking off this list, we have Mystery Type Arceus. As you may know, Arceus has the ability to be any one of the 18 types based on the type of plate that it is holding. As such, it has 18 different forms where its body changes colors depending on the type of plate that it holds. However, when Arceus was introduced, there was a 19th form present in the data of Diamond and Pearl that was never used officially in the games, a form representing the Mystery Type. Now, the mystery type was a sort of stand-in type symbolized by three question marks that was only really attributed to the move Curse and did not have any type of effectiveness or resistance. It was removed from the games by Gen 5, but this didn't stop Arceus from receiving a mystery type form, the sprite of which can be found within the data of the Gen 4 games. It cannot be used or accessed without some type of cheat device, naturally because it's not supposed to be obtainable, and because there is no mystery type plate, but it's fascinating to think about the possibilities of what this Arceus form could have been. It likely was never meant to be used officially, but even just the idea of this Arceus form giving some kind of bigger meaning and purpose to the mystery type and what that could have entailed is really interesting to think about, and I would have loved to see it and this Arceus form get a bigger spotlight in the game. Up next, we have the infamous Mega Flygon. No official artwork for this is currently available, but it was stated by Ken Sugimori in an interview that there were plans to include a Mega Flygon in Pokemon X and Y, but he got artist's block at the time and was not able to complete a design that was up to his standards. This is an absolute crying shame given the potential that a Mega Flygon has, especially when all its exclusion was attributed to was artist's block. That's not to say that Artist's Block isn't a real thing, because it definitely is, it's just unfortunate that it had to happen for what would have been a Pokemon as cool as this. And it's also a shame that to this point, the idea has never been revisited either. It's possible we might see a return to Mega Evolution at some point, and that's when we'll see Mega Flygon make its triumphant debut, but for now this is an amazing case of what could have been that unfortunately never got to see the light of day. Going back to the days of Gen 4, we have a biggie, and that is the recently leaked Gen 4 Gender Different Sprites. In Generation 4, the concept of gender differences was introduced, giving some Pokemon physical differences based on their gender, which is an overall welcome addition to the Pokemon world. However, this idea was originally much larger in scale, as at the end of 2019, there were hundreds of beta sprites leaked from Diamond and Pearl that showed that nearly every Pokemon, if not not all of them, were going to receive gender differences originally, instead of just a select few. After some evaluation by the community at large, it seems to be the case that these are the real deal, which is absolutely crazy given the massive scope that this feature originally had. As far as I can tell, I don't know that we have access to all of the sprites anymore, as they were taken down very quickly after being posted online, but several were kept and reposted by the community, giving a very interesting glimpse into how many Pokemon could have had their appearances changed drastically based on their gender. This was likely cut due to the fact that it was simply biting off way more than Game Freak could chew, as if they would have kept this around, they would have practically doubled the amount of sprites and eventually 3D models that they would have had to make for every subsequent Pokemon game, so honestly, it probably wasn't a bad idea on their part to scale back the idea a bit. But the idea that we were originally going to have way more gender differences is definitely exciting for sure. 
Moving from Gen 4 to Gen 6, we have something that's not nearly as substantial, but still very noteworthy. At E3 2013, Pokemon X and Y made an appearance to promote the game ahead of its release in October of that year, and in pre-release footage shown at the event, Shiny Go-Go was revealed, however, in this footage, it was completely different to how it ended up in the final game, and unfortunately looks way worse in the final game, in my opinion, compared to how it was originally. So the question then becomes, why was it changed so drastically? And why change something as random and relatively insignificant within the entire scope of the game, such as this, a mere four months before the game's release, especially after showing it off publicly at E3? It's not uncommon for games shown at E3 to visibly change by the time they've released, but like I said, it just seems like such a quirky thing to change so last minute. Someone at Game Freak must have taken particular exception to how it looked originally, or had an idea that they absolutely had to implement, which resulted in the final look of Go Goat Shiny. Whatever the case may be, I can definitely say personally that I wish it would have stayed the way it was, but the fact that it changed certainly makes for an interesting story nevertheless. Also coming out of Kalos, or should I say should have came out of Kalos, is none other than the infamous Eternal Flower Floet. If you've played Pokemon X and Y, you would know that AZ has a special floet that is at the center of the plot of those games, and it's a unique form of floet that cannot normally be obtained. Well, this was planned to eventually be changed, as within the data of Pokemon X and Y that even carried over into Pokemon Sun and Moon as well, was an obtainable version of the Eternal Flower Floet that even came complete with its own signature move, Light of Ruin. Now, at the very least, this was obviously planned to be distributed as an event Pokemon, while at the most it could have been a distribution that was related to the very likely cancelled Pokemon Z, as there is a multitude of other evidence to support the existence of that game, but despite being fully programmed into X and Y, it mysteriously was never utilized at all. Even if it was for a Pokemon Z though, and that didn't happen, you would think that the distribution for X and Y could have still happened, considering it was in the game ready to go, and it's not like it was something that had yet to be revealed. As I mentioned, Eternal Flower Floet is a central fixture in the game, so it very easily could have been used simply to promote the titles, but even though it seemed like only a matter of time before Game Freak would formally introduce it, that time slowly passed by with no such announcement, until we reached where we are today where it's nothing more than an odd forgotten piece of Pokemon history. There's no doubt in my mind that Eternal Flower Floet was going to be a part of something larger, and things ultimately fell through, so I can only hope that someday we'll get to learn more about the strange story of this unused Floet form. Going back in time a bit, we've got one from Generation 2, and that would be this Raikou and Suicune fusion. Now this one is interesting in its own unique way, because as far as I can tell, the purpose of this particular design isn't really known. It was drawn by Muneo Saito, who was also the person who designed the Legendary Beasts, so that certainly lends itself to the idea that this could have been an option for Raikou and Suicune in terms of their own designs, but at that point is where this really starts to branch off. Was this going to be a legitimate fusion of Raikou and Suicune, or was it an original design that eventually split into two separate Pokemon? Or maybe it was just a casual drawing showing what Raikou and Suicune would look like fused together together that really had no significance in terms of the actual design process for these Pokemon. The origin of why this design came about is just as interesting as the design itself, and even though we can't really say for sure if this alternate form was legitimately considered as a different version of these Pokemon, or if it was something less official, it nevertheless provides some interesting insight into what could have been a different direction for these two legendary Pokemon. This next one is an example of why the title of this video says never made it to the final games as opposed to simply cut altogether, because while it's been stated to be a canon thing that has even appeared officially in places like the manga, it has never made its way into the main series Pokemon games, and that would be the Snowless forms for the Vanillite family. 
Thanks to tweets by the designer of the Vanillite line himself, James Turner, it has been revealed that the snowy outward appearance of this family of Pokemon isn't actually their true identity, and the white is simply a snow covering that can be removed to show their true bodies. James even provided a sketch of this in his tweets, and although it's more so in his personal style as opposed to an official piece of concept art, it still gives you an idea of what is going on here. It's actually pretty similar to what goes on with Ice Q in Sword and Shield with its ice face ability, other than the fact that once again, it has not been seen in the games. It has, however, been seen in the manga, where Vanillite's snowless form was revealed to the shock of everyone involved. So given the fact that this is all official and not even really cut content, it's kind of odd that it's not in the main series games themselves. It would obviously add an extra layer to the Vanillite family's designs, which could help their appeal, and some kind of stat change or ability could have even been attached to it if Game Freak so choose. But for whatever reason, it was not deemed important enough to be a quote-unquote official part of these Pokemon's designs, which is honestly a shame because it seems like it could have been a fun element to what these Pokemon are all about. Moving on, we now have something that's essentially the reverse of all of these other instances, because it's actually a case of a single unused form that gave rise to two separate ones, and that would be for Shellos and Gastrodon. This one has been well documented, but essentially, not only were Shellos and Gastrodon originally going to be Gen 3 instead of Gen 4 Pokemon, but they also originally had a design that was different than what appeared in the final Diamond and Pearl games. In the case of Shellos especially, these forms look like both the East Sea and West Sea variations of the Pokemon combined into one, which is likely where these Pokemon's designs originated before it was decided to give them two separate forms. However, through the decision to create multiple forms for these Pokemon, it in effect left this third unused form behind, which never saw the light of day. This one is more of a design evolution than a true separate form that was scrapped, admittedly, but given the fact that it gave rise to a multi-form Pokemon, I thought it was ironic that the two forms coming to fruition ultimately left an unofficial third form in the dust, even if it was just a beta stage of the design. And this also just goes to show how much the designs of Pokemon can grow and evolve over time. Going back to Gen 5, we have another Unova Pokemon with a situation similar to the Vanillite family we talked about earlier, and that would be Golurk, who coincidentally enough was also designed by James Turner. Golurk has a form that has been seen in Poke Park 2, as well as very recently in the Sword and Shield anime, that technically consists of two different forms, and it is known as its Canon Mode. Now, because this has been seen in official material, even if not in the main series games, it can be considered canon. Okay, sorry, I had to. But in all seriousness, this isn't a cut form. It's not like it was scrapped or anything, but for whatever reason, it just hasn't appeared in the main series games. As I mentioned, canon mode consists of Golurk literally looking like a cannon, but also looking like a sort of rocket as well, as it can use its limbs to propel itself into the air. Just like Vanillite, I feel like this would have made Golurk way more interesting if it was actually in the main series games, and now that it's officially in the anime, as well as a bigger spin-off title, it's just all the more strange that we have not yet seen it make an appearance in the mainline titles to this point. Finally, we have a very interesting one relating to none other than the baby form of the series mascot, Pichu. Courtesy of some translations done by Twitter user Dogasu's Backpack, the spiky-eared Pichu that we see as an event Pokemon in Heart Gold and Soul Silver was actually originally going to be a white Pichu instead, according to Shoko Nakagawa, the host of the Pokemon Sunday show in Japan. Via her autobiography, concept art of this white Pichu can even be seen, being shown off by Nakagawa herself. She goes on to say that there were big plans for white Pichu, as there were even talks to make a branded white cream stew to go along with the distribution of this Pokemon, but for whatever reason, spiky-eared Pichu got the final nod instead. A white Pichu would have been interesting for sure, and in my opinion would have been a little more interesting than a Pichu with one spiky ear as its only real difference. Not that I'm not a fan of spiky-eared Pichu, but I certainly would like to know more about white Pichu as well, so hopefully one day more info will come to light. 
Thank you all so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please leave a like as it really helps out, and subscribe if you're new for more Pokemon content all the time. Let me know what you think about these forms as well in the comments below, and if you'd like to support the channel further, you can listen to my Pokemon remixes on Spotify, and check out my Pokemon Cardinal project if you haven't yet, both of which are massively appreciated and help me to make content just like this. With that being said though, I'll be back on Thursday with another video, so be sure to hit that notification bell so you can be notified as soon as it goes live, and with all that being said, I love you guys very much, and I will smell you guys later.